Podcast. Oi, desculpa interromper seu podcast. Você vende em redes sociais, mas não consegue acompanhar o ritmo do inbox e anda perdendo vendas? Venda automaticamente com uma loja online da Nuvem Shop, conectada ao Instagram, TikTok e Google Shopping. Empreendedores como Joel J, Camila Farani e mais de 130 mil lojas estão com a gente. Comece hoje mesmo. Nuvem Shop, a paixão por empreender nos une. Lu, vim assistir a partida de tênis. Vou falar baixinho. Dolarizei parte da minha carteira de investimento com a Avenue. Agora tem conta nos Estados Unidos e invisto em qualquer ativo lá. Diversificação, moeda forte. Você sabe, né? A ideia é blindar o patrimônio e evoluir. Dá uma olhada. www.avenue.us A partida vai começar. Beijos. Conquiste o green card dos seus investimentos. Avenue. Evolução real em dólar. Welcome to Nature Fact. In today's episode, Fiona Alston interviewed Nicholas Koskela, founder and chief impact officer at Impact Office Earth. Enjoy the show. Hello and welcome to the Nature Backed podcast. We are here live from Impact Day in Tallinn. And today my first guest is Nicholas Cascala. Hello, Nicholas. So you're founder and chief impact officer at Impact Earth, at impactoffice.earth. Yes. Quite the mouthful. Yeah. <laughs> so please tell us, what exactly do you do? Okay, thanks. Uh, thanks for having me, first of all. So, yeah, I've been working on sustainability, climate change, sustainable development for the past 20 years, first in civil society and different international civil society organizations, and then more recently, like, together with businesses. And uh, about a year ago, I founded my own consultancy, Impact Office Dirt, through which I help companies go beyond sustainability to achieve more impact. Uh, but then I'm also still very heavily involved with several NGOs and non-profits. I founded Protect Our Winters, or the Finnish chapter of this Protect Our Winters um, movement, which is a climate movement from, for the winter sports community. Uh, I'm chairperson of Pro Veggie, which is a, 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 an association in Finland that advances plant-based food. I'm chairperson of the Compensate Foundation that works in carbon markets and uh, nature markets uh, trying to improve their integrity so i have various roles okay. and then i'm also uh, yeah i also take uh, manage public affairs for oatly in finland so uh, yeah lots of roles okay so this protect our winters this is very interesting tell us a little bit more about that i'm the minute you said winter sports my ears pricked okay, up yeah. so actually about um what would i say Tw about 20 years ago the movement started or 2007-8 The movement started in in, uh, in the U.S., where some snowboarders, especially a guy called Jeremy Jones, who was a really one of the world's best free riders, um, noticed that his own community wasn't doing anything into uh, combat climate change or the climate crisis, while they were already seeing the impacts and effects of the climate crisis on their own hobbies and their own lifestyles. Yeah. So yeah, I've been skiing since I was two years old, and I also have a very passionate. Uh, I'm very passionate about winter sports. So about 10 years ago, I took up the uh, picked up the phone and, and called the U.S. and asked if I can uh, uh, if I can create a Finnish chapter for Protect Our Winters. And ever since, I've been involved with that. And nowadays, I think Protect Our Winters is in 20 different countries and trying to mobilize the winter sports, winter sports community to kind of use their passion for what they love, the outdoors, winter sports, etc., and turn that passion into purpose in terms of combating climate change and preventing uh, climate change from actually preventing us from uh, having winter sports anymore. So it's, climate crisis is actually an existential threat to winter sports. In, 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 so it's uh, turning that passion we have today into purpose is, is what we try to do. Okay, give us a, an example of what you've done in Finland then. Um, well, we've done, we do a lot of political advocacy, especially in the area of, of mobility, because uh, traveling to the mountains, traveling to the snow yeah. is the main cause of emissions within the winter sports community. So we really want to focus on that. But then we work very closely with ski resorts, with brands, trying to push them to be also more vocal when it comes to them being active, not just like limiting uh, their emissions, but being more proactive 
and maybe also encouraging, for example, the visitors to the ski resorts to arrive by land-based travel instead of air travel, for example. So, yeah, these type of things. Is there any, uh, and I suppose this might be more anecdotally mm. than anything, but uh, we're not getting as much snow. Yep. I'm Scottish. We don't get as much snow as we did when I was younger. Um, sometimes there's no ski season in mm -hmm. Scotland or whatever. Does this mean that we have less people interested in winter sports or are those people then traveling to further away yeah. than to you know, have their sports holidays or whatever? It's, it's definitely happening. I can see it. I live in southern Finland, which is, people might think of Finland as a very cold and wintry place, but actually southern Finland, which is by the Baltic Sea, means that it's quite mild during the winters and uh, we don't well, have... Well, mild well, yeah, well, might yeah, okay. be relevant. Sorry, I live in Estonia and it's not a mild winter. To, uh, <laughs> compared to northern Finland, yeah. it's mild. So we actually, I mean, we can nowadays have winters without any snow and that yeah. never happened before. Uh, the climate crisis is actually uh, warming winters much, much more than summers when it comes to the northern parts of Europe. Certain winter months like December have already warmed by 5 degrees Celsius since uh, pre-industrial times. So it is already happening and if, like, if the climate keeps warming at the current pace, Yes. By around like mid-century, a bit after mid-century, the climate in Finland and Sweden will resemble the climate of Poland or Hungary these days. Okay. So that's goodbye for winter sports in many cases. Yeah. yeah. That would so be So that's shame. what I mean with an existential threat. Yes. No, I understand. Okay, let's talk about uh, Impact Office Earth, yeah. <laughs> which I managed to say correctly this time. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so what is it that you do there? And also explain to me a little bit about um, what is the main issue that uh, mm. businesses have sort of scaling their sustainability and their impact? Well, actually what I do is I try to show that sustainability is not enough. So we have immense global challenges. Uh, we've crossed six of what are so-called planetary boundaries within which like, which um, sort of create a safe operating space for humanity. Yeah. Uh, we're way beyond where we should be on climate change, nature loss. We're next close to the sixth mass extinction of species, all because of human activity. So if you think about traditional sustainability, it's about limiting the harm you cause, right? It's about reducing emissions 5% this year, 5% next year, etc. Maybe reaching 50% emission reductions by 2035. Okay. But that's like this uh, narrative or this uh, framework of limiting the harm is no longer enough because we're already on overtime in many of these cases. So what we should be, be focusing on, and I think traditional sustainability thinking actually prevents us from realizing this, is that we should be focusing on creating positive impact and not on how do we minimize the harm we cause. Because if we think about limiting, minimizing harm, we don't really question if the business model in itself is future proof. Yeah. Can we have such like fossil fuel companies are the perfect example. Obviously they shouldn't exist anymore or like pretty mm -hmm. soon. But what they're trying to do is reduce their emissions. Or airlines are a good example. They're um, maybe introducing sustainable aviation fuel. So in 10 years from now, 10% of the fuel they use is sustainable. 90% will still be fossil. So that's the sort of false uh, paradigm that prevents us from seeing that that's not the solution. The solution is to question those business models and think about creating new ones that are all about like um, sort of uh, rebuilding, ecological rebuilding uh, or restoration that needs to take place. Yeah. So that's what I'm trying to, with my clients and, and, and the businesses I work with, is to open their eyes and see how they can change the business model. And then also to think about what their impact on society is beyond the, per the products or services that they have. So how they use their voice, how they use their purchasing power, how they use their political advocacy in order to like enhance or uh, for, for broader societal change and not just think about how they limit, not to think about their like uh, scope just through the products or services that they have. Um, is this an ongoing thing all the time or is there something that uh, companies can do immediately to kind of kickstart their journey? Well, I think first they need to realize what I realized some years ago okay. is that this sustainability is only a, a, a sort of a mid 
or, or short-term goal. We yeah. need to quickly go beyond that. Okay. So I'll give you an example. So the um, the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is the biggest or the best metric for are we doing enough uh, in terms of climate change. When I was born, it was 337 parts per million. Now it's about 420 something. But the safe limit it should, would be 350 parts per million. Okay. And we crossed that in 1987. So we've gone way beyond the point of the safe, safe limit, sort of. But what are we doing every day? We're adding more carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, each and every one of us, each every company. So even if we were to like miraculously stop emitting today, we would still have a huge issue with too much carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. It's sort of like having a bathtub. If the bathtub is the atmosphere and the water that's run in there, that's running in there is the carbon dioxide, we've had the tap on for centuries, decades, and the water is already overflowing. It's, kind of, it's so high up that it's flowing over the edges of the bathtub. So our solution can't be just to turn the tap off by 5% this year, 5% next year. It'll just contribute to the problem even more. We need to close it, but then we also need to remove the, 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 the plug and drain the excess water out. So this is what I'm trying to say that like a traditional sustainability approach, which is focusing on limiting harm, is missing the big problem, which should be how do we create, for example, business models that remove more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere than they emit. Yes. So it's kind of changing this paradigm around and, and seeing. And, and this sort of uh, realization is the first step I think businesses have to take. Then what that leads to depends on the, on the, uh, on the market or where they operate. But uh, this sort of wake-up call should happen first. And also, I'm interested in, do businesses take ownership as well of the carbon emissions, say, throughout the whole supply chain, you know? Mm -hmm. how, how does that work? How does that factor into um, calculating their carbon emissions? Yeah, I mean, through the different uh, frameworks today, science-based targets, etc., obviously you need to calculate and report on all your value chain emissions, including scope three, which is the tricky one. Yeah. Uh, but I would say that even like taking that into account is really not enough if you're still just working on, you know, minimizing it incrementally, the emissions in your value chain. Yeah. You should really think about focusing your work on how do you actually like, how the, the sort of core business model doesn't require uh, minimizing harm, but rather and maximizing your positive impact. Okay, so it's not just thinking inwardly, but also looking outwardly across. Exactly, and how you use your um, influence in order to change your value chain as well. And there, it's not just your like your business transactions, but also how you work uh, through your advocacy work, uh, how you do your uh, like consumer outreach, how you, for example, try to impact consumer behavior. So it's about like having a broader kind of mission and really like questioning why does your company exist yeah okay <laughs> <laughs> philosophical right <laughs> yeah. Yeah. gone very deep now. Yeah, yeah. okay um and the last thing i wanted to ask is are we going to get past this um using sustainability as a token gesture you know like a, a box ticking exercise in companies like well right now a lot of companies are really focused on uh on uh, like uh, there's been a lot of EU directives lately that put yeah. them under a lot of pressure in terms of their reporting. Some of it's good because it also like requires them to really uh, think about like what are the, like doing these materiality analyses and so forth. They really think about where their impact is. But other parts of it are sort of maybe like using the resources that these companies have to just tick boxes or uh, fill in Excel sheets, etc. So I hope we're still maybe in a learning stage with some of these frameworks. Maybe in the future, like some of the processes can be automized, and that frees up the sustainability professionals' like time and thinking to think about more creatively how they can tackle the issue. Not just do compliance yeah. uh, sustainability, but actually think about the positive impact they can have. Okay, uh, you were doing a keynote there yeah. uh, before we <laughs> grabbed you for the podcast. Um, how did that go? And are you feeling some kind of good vibes coming from the audience here today? Yeah, it was nice. A few people came and, and really thanked me, but I was really rushed here, like <laughs> right, right off stage. So 
but I'll head back to listen to more keynotes. I think there's a really interesting program in the afternoon as well. So looking okay, forward. Okay, great. Yeah. Listen, thanks so much for joining us on the podcast. I really appreciate it. And um, we are going to be back with the Nature Backed podcast going live from Impact Day. So don't go away. If you like the show, subscribe and leave a good rating on the podcast platform of your choice. It would mean a world to us. Hey, heard you like podcasts. Well, check out Dollar Bets. Two sports guys with faces for radio betting live money against each other on air. That's Dollar Bets with a Z. Find us on the winner's edge. Hello, folks. Earl Breon here, host of the Responsible Leadership Podcast, part of the Best Business Network on ElectroCast. You're looking for a show to bring you some of the best leadership advice from some of the top thought leaders around the globe. This is the show for you. You can find us on all the podcast platforms of choice or on social media by following me, Earl Breon, B-R-E-O-N. Electric acid.